Hi everyone, Nicole van der Hooven here, and in my last video, I'd kind of messed up on setting up the thresholds for my first load test on K6. So this time I want to rerun that and set up the thresholds properly just to see how they work. And then I want to kind of check on the options for comparing one, one run of a test to another, because a lot of times that's where the value of load testing is going to be. You're able to see differences from one run to another. So yesterday I ended up running a second test. It's the same sort of setup as the, the one in the last video. I just wanted to check out the thresholds, but it's probably a good time to talk about the structure of K6 as well. The first level is the project level. I would probably have one project for each, maybe each team, or um, if one team tests multiple applications, maybe I would do it by application, just to kind of um, organize it within K6. And then within that project, I've got this test scenario, and it's I would use this as one set of circumstances that you want to test. So it could be like a load test or a stress test. And the reason is that each run of this test scenario is going to be grouped together. So you wouldn't necessarily want to be comparing for instance, this one is is like a shakeout test, right? So I only ran 10 virtual users, you wouldn't want to have stress tests being compared to shakeout tests. You know, that, that doesn't really make too much sense. So I would probably create different test scenarios for, um, for the different circumstances that you want to test in, depending on your purpose. So yesterday I saw that the test had failed because of the thresholds that I'd set up, or rather the way that I'd set up the thresholds. Uh, this was not as I intended, so I actually changed it in the second test that I ran. So if we look at the configuration here and go back into thresholds, I think this is how you're actually supposed to do it. So what you put here is the SLA or the service level agreement. So it's going to be what would be acceptable for your application. And obviously you can add more thresholds there. For this one, I just put that I want the response, response time to be less than one second. And I didn't really want to stop a test in case it went above that. But I did want the test to fail if the response time was over a second, at least for the 90th percentile. So um, that's why if you look here, this test, oops, let's go back here. So this test failed because I set up the threshold incorrectly, but this one passed because it was under the 1000 milliseconds or one second that I that I had put in. One cool thing that I did um, notice though, is if you go into e any of these tests and click on the options here, you can set something as the baseline. So if, uh, let's say I'll set that. A baseline test is really important in load testing because it gives you a starting point. So think of it as an experiment. As load testers, we are experimenting, but we also need a control group. So if we're testing whether build B of an application is better or worse, we need to know what we're comparing that to. So it's not enough just to run a test after the changes have been made. It's usually a good idea to have a baseline test from before the change occurred. So in this case, you'd have a, a load test for build A and then a load test on build B. That way you can definitively tell whether B was better or worse than A. A baseline test is also a great opportunity to kind of fix some of the variables that you're going to be using for this particular test scenario because you don't want to be in a situation where, you know, the test that you have on build A is running a thousand users, but the other test that you have on build B is running 10,000 users. So it's obviously that's going to make a big difference on the performance. What you want to do is test them at the same level of users and duration, uh, things like ramp up or the load profile, including transactions, think time, and, and all of that. You would ideally want to fix that so that when you compare them, the only thing that could have contributed to the difference 
is the thing that you're measuring, which would be, for example, your application code. So uh, I've set this test as the baseline, and I'll go back into this test scenario, and I'll compare the failed test to it. So when you go into it, you can then click Compare Result, and it'll the baseline test will be marked with a star. So you can then click on that, and if you want to compare to different tests, if you have more than one, you can also change it here. But then look, you can see, you can kind of compare them um, side by side and in a situation where the application changed builds between these tests, it would be really useful because this is the view that will let you spot differences pretty quickly. So I really, I, I definitely like that. And scrolling down here, you'll see the differences in the response time metrics too. One thing I noticed is if you go to analysis here, you'll still be able to add new metrics to, to chart after the fact, but all of these will be for the test that you selected. So this is my failed one. So what I would do is I'd probably um, actually add a note so this is this was my very first test. I'd already added this. So I say um, failed threshold so that later on when I look at this, I'm not going to wonder why this test failed. Another thing that I learned is that you can also set up a schedule. So if I click on this, I can actually set this same test to repeat every day. This is really good for continuous integration. The old way of thinking about a load test is as a singular activity that happens at the end of the software development cycle. While there is some use to load tests like that that are huge and really stress out the system, I am also a huge fan of the teeny tiny load test that is run regularly because the fact that it's being run regularly gives you a continuous view of your application performance. So it's not just, you know, after the big release, it's after maybe every commit, maybe you do it every day. So having something like the scheduling feature is going to give you a lot more data points and that will allow you to pinpoint exactly when performance deteriorated or improved. So imagine when you set this, you'll have one for every day or, or every build. And over time, you'll still be able to get a sense for what build exactly it was that caused performance deterioration or improvement. So far, I think Test Builder is a really great way to get started without really any coding experience even. You just need the URLs and it's all in the UI, so it's really easy to do. So what I want to do next time is take a step back and look at k the open source tool, and see how easy it is to get started with that and what extra options, advanced options there are available for a load tester who maybe wants to have a bit more of a custom load profile. Catch you in the next one.